Well, that, that, that was really very nice. What a warm welcome. I am very happy to be here. I also want to introduce Kay Belt, who comes with me. She and I work together down in Homestead, Florida, having left Long Island, uh, deciding New York was far too intense. We could not possibly afford to keep up with all the arts that go on there. So we decided to get a little bit closer to what was going on in Miami. And very happy to be here in Southern California, especially having missed Hurricane Irene and Hurricane Sandy, which totally wiped out our house in Freeport, Long Island. <laughs> so it's, it's been a great change. Um, I have been doing uh, arts marketing now for, for quite a while. I started, oh, I'm not going to say how far back, but my first job was at the uh, Long Island, uh, Los Angeles Philharmonic. <clears throat> so when I moved over to the Long, Long Island Philharmonic, I kept getting them confused. Um, the Hollywood Bowl, then to the Chicago Symphony. So my background has been a great deal in the orchestra world, and I think you'll see a lot of examples that I'm going to go through today um, related to the orchestra world. But what I can tell you that I've discovered just in, in listening to you introduce your organizations, and I will also let you know that I looked you all up yesterday because I, I uh, saw the RSVP list, and I checked out all of your websites um, and got a little bit of a flavor for what you're all about and what you do. And I just want you to know that this is an extremely diverse group of organizations. Uh, Every community is unique, and every community has its own unique audiences. And each one of you are tapping into both similar and yet different people. So today's workshop is going to be about taking you through the 101 of, of marketing. Uh, so that we came up with this idea because with the subsequent workshops that come, it would be a good thing for you to do is to be able to contextualize what you hear afterwards. And today's purpose is to give you uh, basically an overview. Let me ask you the question, how many of you have a written marketing plan? Now, now be honest, a written marketing plan. Okay, so you've got definitely different levels of experience and education in this, in this area and there is no manual, really. I mean, you will get books and you'll get a lot of theory, and today we're going to talk through steps and theory. But for you to really make this work for you and for each other together is to, to open up and, and talk a little bit about your organizations on how what we're discussing actually relates or maybe doesn't relate, because you may find this doesn't apply to me. But you will find, no matter how large an organization, and I'm talking not just uh, the Chicago Symphony or the New York Philharmonic, I'm talking about IBM, Coca-Cola, uh, Starbucks, down to the smallest organizations, follow the same process. And this, these are the steps we're going to take you through today. Feel free to interrupt. Feel free to engage. To, for this to work, it's going to require not me just lecturing you, but hearing back from you. Now, in 2012, following a, a number of years of, of study, of surveys, the National Endowment for the Arts published its latest uh, state-of-the-arts uh, statistics. And what they wanted to do is to know how are the arts doing in the United States. Well, what seems probably positive is that while not as much as 50 percent, but pretty close to half the population to a third of the population are actively engaged in the arts. Um, you might consider it, you, are you surprised? Do you think it should have been more? Do you think it's too low? It's hard to know what represents the arts. Popular motion pictures, um, what else? Trashy novels, you know, all of these things <laughs> are considered culture, but not necessarily what we would include as uh, quality art forms. So they defined it according to these categories, among others, classical music, jazz, dance, other than ballet, world music, 
Latin, Spanish, salsa, ballet, and opera. So we know that Spanish language culture is a growing population and may soon be more than half the population of the US. That is a growing area. Now, take a look, though. If you think we're all struggling, you're right. The entire country is going through uh, the throes of finding itself once again. There was a period of time where the arts were in growth. Um, by 2002, we were already starting to decline. Then there was the, the recession of 2008. And, and it's passed. And the country is coming back. What's happening to the arts? If you've noticed the numbers, even compared to 2008, they're continuing to decline, which means that the world and the behavior of our, our population is changing. And we know that there's a lot of work to do to bring this back. So what do we want to accomplish today? We know that there's the population out there. And of that population, there is a percentage less than half of what we call the arts users. And arts users are now being measured in more than just going to live events, live performances, and getting out there. They're including uh, people who participate in music through the internet, downloads, um, watching performances online. Very um, digital world is now being included in arts participation. Now that is great. How does that affect us? Probably not tremendously because most of what we do is probably live interaction with our audiences. So our goal is to be able to get our share of the market. The amount of money it takes to bring in new market share is tremendous. That responsibility is going to have to be to the, the schools and the government and um, the major foundations and organizations that are trying to drive the population to a higher level of quality of life. And we know how that's going, right? <laughs> so this is what we're after. Now, are we going to be poaching from each other? Yes and no. We, we can talk about that. <laughs> so we're going to start off with the who and what we are. And what we refer that to as is the term brand. Now, you've all heard the term brand before, right? What, is, what does that mean? Anybody want to venture a definition for the word brand? Come on, break the ice here. OK, that's good. Somebody else want to add to that? Public face, that's good. Somebody else? All of those are true. We define it really quick. It's your promise to your customers, your patrons, your donors, what you are going to deliver to them, your, your brand. Now, your logo and your graphic image is not your brand. You may think that it is, but it's not. What that is is it's the symbol of your brand. It's what's behind that image. So let's look at some of these popular brands. Take a look at these. Do any of you feel any loyalty? We call it brand loyalty. Do you feel any loyalty to any of these, any, any of these icons here? Even peripherally? OK, which, okay, which one? OK, so that you see that apple, and, and you get a, 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 a sense. OK. How, High prices, closed architecture, general quality related to the product, great. How about, how about another one? Somebody else have a, a loyal? Yes. So you're a Google loyalist. And why is that? Yeah, I feel the same way you do. Every time I see Bing, it's like, Microsoft. <laughs> right. So actually, you're getting a sensation. You're getting a reaction when you see the logo. And that's what the logo is supposed to do. It's supposed to give you a visceral reaction 
that will tie you. And their goal in creating these logos is, is to give you a sense that you want to belong. Now, we just outfitted our whole house with Samsung because we just like the Samsung image. It's, it's Korean, it's quality, it's, um, it's not Whirlpool, I guess. <laughs> so our reaction was we, we do this brand loyalty and that's going to happen with you and your organization. Now you all have mission statements. Who can, who can give me in, in like a sentence your mission statement? Who would want to volunteer again? Yes, tell me your name again. Lind Linda, right. Great, great. Somebody else have a vision statement they want to share? Great, great. Mission statements are very important. They fall short a little bit, however, as it relates to marketing. In addition to the mission statement, what you want to develop is called the brand or value statement. Now, what's the difference? The brand statement is what makes you unique and how you serve. Now, you have a lofty ambition, Linda. I say you have a lofty ambition with your organization. Say it again. What? Okay, now there are other organizations that want to do the same thing, inspire kids through art. How do you do that differently than the next guy? So by making that statement and thinking about it and refining it, you will then end up with that unique brand statement that says why what you do is different than what the next art school might do. It's when Starbucks, and I'll show you an example, when Starbucks says, you know, our goal is to let people buy great coffee, well, so does Maxwell House can say the same thing and many others. But what Starbucks does in the next step is they explain how they do it better and why they do it. And let's take a look. So here's a Starbucks mission statement. To inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person at a time, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. What do you, what do you think, have you ever seen much advertising for Starbucks? Only, think about this now, the only advertising that you see for Starbucks, other than in the New York Times, because they have reciprocal trade, is what they sell in the supermarkets, the product they sell in the supermarkets. Their whole marketing plan is to put a store on every corner and people see the Starbucks logo and know what they're gonna find inside. And that's based on you know, an overall strategy and a value statement. So let's take a look at that. Their brand statement is broken down into multiple areas. First they talk about their value of their coffee. They say it has been and always will be about quality. Uh, they're passionate about ethically sourcing the finest coffee beans, roasting them, et cetera, et cetera. That tells how they make their coffee better, their value for their coffee. Then they talk about their customers, their value and promise to their customers. When we're fully engaged, we connect with, laugh with, and uplift the lives of our customers, even if just for a few moments. And think about when you think of Starbucks as opposed to uh, going into McDonald's for a cup of coffee, it's a totally different experience and it's reflected in this. Now, why is a brand statement important? Because when you have a decision to make, you go back both to your mission statement and your brand statement and say, how does this fit into those goals? And it helps you make a far more in informed decision. It also gives you the elevator speech so that when you're communicating with your board members and your audiences, they're all getting the same message. Everybody knows what Starbucks is like. They've probably been there, but they've been very clear as what the message is. You'll, you'll see some, uh, Brands go, go askew, 
maybe some of the car manufacturers where they come out with a car that made no sense according to their image and their brand, like when Cadillac had to abandon luxury cars because nobody wanted to pay for them anymore. They were, they were not in, in big demand, so they went into the, um, the SUVs and the, the muscle cars and totally lost their way, and it took a bailout from the government to bring them back. And you know, now they're coming back because they've done a whole new marketing direction. But you can see how you can get off track when you lose your, your brand identity. Here's some of the ways to go about it. I mean, in the case of something like Tiffany's, it's an overall image of consistent with the blue uh, box and, and elegance, all about elegance. They, they have a slogan, Tiffany's does, where they never have a sale. They never put any of their items on sale. And the reason is because they feel that it's always timeless and it's never going to go off the shelf, so why should they be discounting? What they do instead to get a whole range of people to buy product is have a whole range of, pr of, of prices. What do you think is the most popular sales item at Tiffany's that they sell the most of and make the most from? Anybody want to venture a guess? Heart a heart necklace? <laughs> Actually, it's a $35 pen. <laughs> because it's a pen that's made of silver and it says Tiffany's on it and everybody wants the brand. It's why Chanel, I guess, can charge those big prices that they advertise, but when you see something for Chanel that's under $40, you'll probably think, wow, what a bargain. So this is uh, Tiffany's. Now here's one. Look how understated the logos are because everybody recognizes it. What, what do you think was behind this? This was for a um, Mercedes SUV where they're trying to show that it's a rugged car in the Mercedes brand. So what you see is the ti as tire tracks are actually not really tire tracks. They're very elegant uh, skaters in silver. And if you think about it, the whole image of this safe car is about its elegance. Now here's what happens when your, your logo becomes an icon. You don't even have to mention it. And uh, I thought this was pretty clever to advertise free Wi-Fi at McDonald's. In fact, the iconography is so strong that their next ad didn't need words at all. <laughs> Just potato chips and a Wi-Fi symbol. <laughs> now here's a, a show that made itself iconographic with the waif. And she's back. You know exactly what that means. OK, so for the iPhone 6, they're just coming out with the iPhone 6, and they're trying to find their way. Well, they experimented with different kinds of branding. So they've got multiple audiences. And we're going to talk about how to identify audiences shortly. But. Um, there are two ways to see the iPhone. It, it's for the, the geek freak that wants all the apps and just sees it as the everything phone. And then the new one with the different sizes, it's based on elegance, competing with other, t other, other phones, comparing itself to the old iPhone and saying, you know, we're just getting sleeker and sleeker. And that's, and that's our direction. But you'll notice, for example, that uh, they go from the busy apps to just the chrysanthemum to tell their story. Now we're going to get into an area called uh, the four Ps. Anybody know what the four Ps are as a teaser for later? Um, One, I saw, I saw the hands sort of go up. OK. I, I think I'm the first right out of college, so I can probably remember the marketing class. OK, good. Well, <laughs> we'll get. Go, yeah, that, we're going to start with that. But yes, that, one, one of you knows the four Ps. This is a, a marketing um, 101 must. So we're going to go into that a little bit. Uh, product is, is one of them. Positioning is the fifth of the four Ps. <laughs> and here's the way another competitor is positioning himself against the iPhone, which was the, the, the major brand. 
um, Samsung with their alternative a slogan that says it doesn't take a genius and all the problems that people associate with the uh, iPhone, they're saying they over, are overcoming it. And that, that's the way they sell. Now let's bring this into the arts. Um, here are some icons, some, some um, logos from these arts organizations. What's one of the difficulties that individual arts organizations have compared to multinational corporations? Funds. Funds, right. Money, size, physical reach. So we looked at the most popular of, of well, let's say the most well-known. I mean, uh, somebody wants to throw out another organization that's as well-known or better than these. Um, please feel free at Carnegie Hall, other organizations that are known around the world. You'll notice that at the same time that they have some kind of a graphic associated with it, they still need to have a, what we call the logo type. And I'm very impressed with your, your, your branding over there for visionary school with the visionary, with, with the words and, and an image. I mean, it definitely is something you recognize. Um, think of your, your own logos and brands, uh, your, your icons. Um, it's hard to get the message through if people don't get bombarded with your messages so that it's a constant repeat, repeat. So having some kind of a logo type is helpful, is, is almost mandatory. So the idea of the brand. How many of you feel like you've developed your brand? Tom, your own personal brand. I was thinking when I looked at your, we, we saw some of Tom's photography, um, very strong image. I was thinking of other photographers that are easily recognizable based on the images they take, like Richard Avedon. He actually had his own little signature in his prints with the, um, the frames coming from the negatives back in the days when people had negatives. Um, Annie Leibovitz, another strong kind of, of image. And, um, you know, from the pictures that we saw, and I looked at your website, Tom, you, you have a whole variety of, uh, of subjects that you, you focus on. So, you know, when... I spent a lot of money on that too. It's not something you take, take lightly. How, how, how much money do you think a company spends on its brand? Anybody have a, a notion like when IBM developed its logo or when Citibank develops its logo? What, what kind of budget do you think they put at something like that? A million. A good million dollars. Well, I think it takes tens of millions to maintain it. And, and we often say, let's, let's shepherd the brand. You know, it's got to make sure that you don't get off track. A company that really has invested tremendous amount to maintain its brand in the arts is the Disney Company, they work with arts organizations around the country, they have symphonic programs, and when you work with Disney, you get brand attacked because they have to approve everything because nothing can go out that, that compromises that. Um, has anybody here wanted, been struggling with an idea for a brand? A good place to start if you feel that you want a place to begin I feel is you, you want to start with your, your strongest supporters. Who, who would you say are your strongest supporters, usually? Our board members. Exactly. One of the great things about board members are that they are very um, loyal and connected to your organization. And, and the reason they are is that they feel their own uh, relationship to you. Now, you talk to any board member and ask four different board members what your organization is about, and you're gonna get four different answers. But this is your opportunity to work with them, almost like a, like a focus group, where you're getting their feedback and getting them to help you distill what it is that makes your organization uh, unique and strong and, and, and special. And begin there, and, and from that you can start to craft the, the brand statement. 
But we'll come back to that. Um, it's going to be in and out all the time with the discussion of the marketing plan. So the next step is for me to take you through the concept of the marketing plan. Uh, there, there are a number of steps, and um, I'm going to, as I take you through them, I want you to think again that your organization is very different than your neighbors, and how does this work for me, and am I going too far into a certain direction that's beyond what your organization can accomplish? And when I show you examples of very elaborate and expensive communications vehicles like brochures and letters and things like that, I want somebody to say, well, how am I supposed to do this? <laughs> so why write a marketing plan in the first place? First of all, it gets all your great ideas out of your head. Even if you've written a cursory marketing plan, if your marketing plan is only covering the cost of doing the steps, a marketing plan should be very comprehensive. It should be very detailed because you have many ideas and people will come at you with ideas. Nothing more stressful than a board member coming to you and saying, I think we should try this. And you're going, whoa, that's more work. I haven't considered that. With the marketing plan, you've either considered it and rejected it for whatever the reason, because it's work that doesn't fit or it's taking you in a direction you don't belong. So the idea of getting the ideas out of your head is really important. It also gives you an outline for each of the steps you have to go through. How many of you have um, forgotten something and had to play a lot of catch up or missed a deadline because you didn't have it in the calendar? You know, it's something we all sort of go through. You also want a history of what you've done. One of the things I can tell you that, that Karen and, had, had done when I came to the Long Island Philharmonic was she left a lot of detail of the things that had gone before. There was a huge archive of, of brochures and uh, posters and communications that were going on so we knew what was working and you know we could tr trend it. We could see if it should continue or it was getting burned out. It gives you benchmarks for the results for the next year. So how many of you would say we're having a great season? OK. Now, there are two ways to look at it, right? The two, well, it, it, there's always, right, you got, you got ready. How was, how was last year compared to the year before? All right, doesn't matter. The point is, is that when you are tracking your, your results year after year after year, you can see when things are going up. For example, um, people w who are in the subscription business, uh, they sell subscriptions to their events. They say, um, oh, our renewals are down. Well, that is a loaded question. That's like saying, well, I'm not feeling well. Well, what's wrong with you? And when you start to break it down, it may be a lot of nothing. So, for example, when you are doing a renewal, the longer a person stays with you, the more likely they're going to come back, correct? It's the first time people that um, drop off at a very high rate, correct? So the next year, your renewals are down. Why? Because you did a great job bringing in all these new people. Now, your overall numbers may be still ahead, but your percentages are up. But if you have your benchmarks from year to year to year of the different groups that are responding, you will have a better sense of how you're actually doing. And also, the other great thing about having a marketing plan is funders love it. They think you're really on top of things, and they know how their money is being spent, and they know that you're driving to, do, uh, to improve your results. So that alone makes it worth doing, and you'll get some funding because you have a marketing plan. OK, now let's go into what a marketing plan should look like. We will start with strategies, and we'll discuss what strategies actually look like. Next, separate from strategies, we will start with objectives and goals. Because if you don't know what you're trying to accomplish, you won't know that you've succeeded or that you've failed. 
before you can even type the first word of your new donor uh, fundraising letter, you need to do a situation assessment. And we're going to understand how to create a history or a body of, of, of knowledge that will help you make informed decisions. Then we'll discuss tactics. Everybody wants to do the tactics first. Let's put up posters. Let's uh, send out flyers or brochures or send out an email blast. That comes number four. And then the budget. Once we decide what we want to do, we have to figure out how we're going to pay for it. And every marketing plan should have its conclusion. And we'll discuss what that conclusion should look like. So let's start with strategies. Who can define strategy for me? What do you think the term strategy means? What does strategy mean? It's your plan for how you're going to get to your goal, really. OK, your plan. Um, Okay. Methodology. Okay. How are you going to connect with your audience? What is it that you want? What's your one? Bring that person to your Okay. All right. We're, we're very close. I mean, we, we speak English, so we know the word strategy. Somebody says, we've got to be strategic. We know what that means. A clear definition of the word strategy is what you want to accomplish. In other words, what is, what is our aim. In military, our goal is to take the hill. Our, our strategy is to take the hill. Um, in, in, corp, in the corporate world, our strategy is to make profit. How are we going to do that? You want to sell tickets. You want to sell tickets. That could be a strategy. We want to pack the house. <laughs> Packing the house could be a strategy. Let's see. The idea of the word tactic is how you get there. OK, so you, that would be more the methodology, I would say, how you get there. So the strategy is where you want to go, and the tactic is how you get there. So what, what, what would that look like? All right, so here's the phrase. We want to offer discounts to increase subscriptions. That's easy for me to say. Um, what is that, a tactic or a strategy? Tactic. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> OK, what about we want to increase subscriptions? Strategy. strategy. We want to increase subscriptions, and we're going to do it by offering discounts. To say, let's offer discounts doesn't necessarily tell you, are you going to get to your goal? OK, we want to create introductory programs. Is that a strategy or a tactic? No, it's a tactic. What would be the strategy behind it? We want to lower our demographics and bring in younger people. And we're going to do it by creating introductory programs because our research tells us they know nothing about the art form, let alone us. Next, we go to objectives. OK, so from strategies to objectives. Well, we have two. We'll start with long term. OK, you said we want to pack the house. We want to increase the number of subscribers or members. We want to increase ticket sales. We want to increase the number of smaller donors. OK, backing up, let me take that out for a second. Um, these are objectives, but they're not complete. Because the way to set objectives is to put a numeric against it so that you know what you're trying to accomplish. So increase the numbers of, of subscribers by x. How many? 10%, 5%, 50%. Is it realistic to say we can increase our subscribers by 50%? Well, not, not, not since we've been in business for 30 years. 
increase ticket sales by a certain amount of dollars. How much? Well, they, that will become a part of the revenue. Increase number of smaller donors by X. Those were long-term. What would a short-term goal look like? Well, fill opening night, that's an easy number to project to. You got so many seats, that's what you have to do. Reach revenue goal for a specific event, an easy number to identify. So to set the objectives, your results must be measurable. It's got to be realistic, a stretch. Now, what do I mean by a stretch? Once you've given yourself a good objective and you've made it realistic, can you push yourself a little bit? Can you go a little bit above and beyond? Because if you make it too easy for yourself, you haven't, you haven't challenged yourself enough. And if you make it too far, well, you're never going to attain it. So that's no good either. How have you experienced now reaching your goals down here? I know from, uh, from Nancy that uh, you're dealing with a very seasonal snowbird period. Do you all, do you all have that seasonality that you have to face? You're, you're a school, right? You know, one of the problems of having a very seasonal business is you fall off the map for the rest of the year. Um, we've worked with uh, an organization down in Miami, which is a, 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 a duo piano competition that only puts on its competition every three or four years and disappears, in theory, for the rest of the time. So they came up with their own plan to compensate for the, the quiet time by putting on you know, reasonable concerts to fit the audience that's there and promote the, their name and keep their name in, in, in practice, uh, in, in, in light. Yeah. But um, when you have your own seasonality issues, you can't be losing all your audience. If you do, you, you've got a big problem. You might as well be on tour with them and then move up north again for the winter and serve them up there. But there will be smaller audiences to, to discuss to come up with additional plans. Yeah. Which is something we actually are thinking of uh, actually in the works of talking about small groups performing somewhere through those summer months. That sure. Yeah. Keep your name out there. One of the organizations that we work with down in Miami is, uh, as, as Nancy mentioned, is the Department of Cultural Affairs. And they created this program called Culture Shock Miami, which is a uh, program to get teens, uh, students 13 to 22, to start buying tickets and getting into the habit of going to, to shows and concerts and art, and museums, et cetera. And their big problem for Miami is that there's nothing going on in the summer and people forget about Culture Shock Miami and it has to start all up again because the kids are there but they're not really get, getting any benefit. So they started producing their own shows in the summer, which was so successful now they're producing their own shows all year long. <laughs> and uh, they found it, it worked well for them. They came a, a new way of attacking a, a, a problem like that. Okay, situation assessment is an area that is probably most overlooked in the um, development of the marketing plan. And yet it is so important because it gives you the information you need to make the informed uh, uh, opinion. Company history. Now, if I go to your websites, you have the about section. And the about section tells me what your organization has been and when you were founded and all the great things about your organization. It's not necessarily the best description for your marketing plan because you would not want to put things in your about section in your history that would be valuable in the marketing plan, such as if you think of the history of Miami City Ballet, for example. They just went through a big board upheaval and they brought in a whole new board and a new um, uh, artistic director, and they've got a whole new vision now for the organization, which is really important for their marketing history, that that be covered, because 
what were the problems that brought them to that point in the first place. You don't want to publicize that. You wouldn't put it on your website, but you would want to put it, a realistic history into your marketing plan. I can give you an, an, another example would be the history of the Long Island Philharmonic again, where um, there was a period of tremendous growth, and then the recession hit, and then the bottom dropped out, and uh, it started to come back, but we couldn't wrap the board around it, and the, the strategy became to develop a whole new board, which didn't work out. <laughs> And that was the end of the organization. But part of that development of the new board was to tell that story, that it, why it was necessary. Next thing you need to commit to writing are your customer characteristics. Now, we all think of our customers, and how many of us think of our, our patrons, our buyers, our students, as they are, they, they are our audience? Pretty much, right? Well, they're, they're, they're not. And we're going to come back to the customer characteristics and, and how to identify what your different market seg your, your audience segments are so that you can better communicate to them. The external assessment is what is the environment around you, and that's the next step. And finally, uh, next would be the competitive assessment. And we'll go into that in a little more detail. And the dreaded SWOT analysis. Who knows what SWOT stands for? Can anybody tell me? I saw a hand go up. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Exactly. So let's start with the history and background. Again, as I explained, the details of the current situation, your past marketing outcomes, uh, things you may have tried and failed, things you may have tried and succeeded. Um, in such a year, we started a new music series, and another year we uh, did exhibits of young and emerging artists, um, that sort of thing. Customer characteristics, the segments. There, you have segments. They would look like um, past buyers, future buyers, active buyers, et cetera. The characteristics are called their demographics. Now, who can help me with the word demographic? Age. And yes, it's what a person is, what they, what they, what they are. They're 35 years old, they're married, they own a home, da, da, da. Those are their demographics. Then there is the characteristic called their lifestyles. Now, just because a person is a doctor and you have so many doctors that come to your events doesn't mean that because they're a doctor, they're going to come to your event. So what are their lifestyles? Well, they're snowbirds or they're, they live here all year round. Even that would be a demographic. But they like to go to concerts. They like to go out and eat. They're very social, that sort of thing. You want to know what those characteristics are. And their behaviors. By behaviors, what do I mean? How, how do they buy? How do they come to you? Do they buy online? Do they buy, send you a check? Do they buy through the mail? Uh, do they show up at a box office? Questions about customer characteristics? In looking at some of your organizations, it, I felt like you had several different kinds of, di di several different levels of customers. So, for example, um, catering to a parent market with children. Your funding is not coming necessarily from the parents, are they? Your funding is probably coming from foundations. Some of your parents, go ahead. Mm. Um, and it's doing well, but it's time to expand those horizons for kids. Okay. Somebody else. Different, different levels of supporters. No. Okay. Good. Good. 
Well, usually boards take two, two characteristics. Either they look like your market or they don't. There are either people who support your mission, and this may probably be more true in um, other not-for-profit areas like social services and healthcare, where your customers are the, the, the sick and the poor and the needy, and your supporters are the wealthy and influential who believe in the work that you're doing. You want to keep that in mind, of course, when you're, you're messaging here, who, who it is you're messaging to. OK, external assessment. Um, we're talking about the economic and um, environmental conditions of the period, of, of, the, of the area. So, for example, here in, in Martin County, who could tell me a little bit about Martin County, what, what's going on here? Is, it's a snowbird community, we know that. Right. Well, that's excellent. I mean, that is exactly the nature. Our, our, if your population is a younger demographic, are they moving in? Are they moving out? What's the employment levels here? Is there a, a, a flight of uh, residents? Is there an influx of residents? Population-wise, what do they look like? Uh, Miami is an interesting example. Uh, as a result of the, um, the hotel tax uh, and Miami having a, a, a growth in, in its tourism, the arts organizations were beneficiary of that because the mayor, go figure, the mayor supported the idea that, these, that the arts organizations down there were helping um, attract more tourism. So he wanted to invest in that and he kept his funding levels up, which then gave confidence to corporations and they brought their funding levels up. And the, the idea was that with that kind of influx, the idea would be to expand and to grow, knowing that you'd have support. That's where the external uh, assessment gives you a, a sense of confidence or, or, or caution in going forward. And then the market conditions is part of all of that, as we just said. Next is the competitive assessment. All of us have competitors, not necessarily each other, th though it's possible. But competition in the arts is a very different phenomenon than competition in business. In business, everybody wants the customer who's buying the car, build the brand loyalty, and, and take away market share. We know in the arts that a thriving arts community is beneficial to all the other organizations. So there is a sense of um, there is a sense of collaboration and working together to build a more thriving community, but we still have competition. What would that look like? Well, competition could be running a same orchestral program on the same night with the same repertoire as somebody else is doing, or, or having a, a symphony two weeks apart that was the same symphony as somebody else opening a new exhibit on the same night as somebody else. Um, so you want to know who those competitors are. You can also consider as competition, not everything, anything that takes somebody away from coming to your event is competition, but that's not really the case. The, the truth is, is what specifically and who are, let's say, the top five organizations or activities that prevent your patrons from coming. You know, the Super Bowl could be a competitor. So you want to consider that. And put that to writing. So who would, and what is competition? And finally, the SWOT analysis. <clears throat> so strengths. We all have strengths. That's why we're there. Um, who can help me out and give me a description of the way you would describe your organization as, as a strength? We're going to go through this together. It's one of the most critical parts of the plan because it's what helps you make those tactical decisions. Corporate funders will say, well, you've got to run like a, you've got to be a business. You've got to run yourself like a business. What, 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 what do they mean by that? The purpose of business is to make money. That's it. 
If product line isn't selling, you abandon the product line. You come up with something else that the market research tells you the consumer wants. When you're in the arts, our first, our first responsibility is the creative drive. And nothing should interfere with that. It's the goal of the marketers to help support that drive and attract the audience, which is sort of why subscriptions, while everybody says, oh, subscriptions are dying in, 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 the, in the performing arts, and we have to come up with something else. It was the subscription that built the loyalty that it was irrelevant what was on stage because your, your subscribers just wanted to see everything you had to offer. And now people are so picky and choosy that if you put a new commission on, on, a, on a program, yeah, you'll sell more tickets, but is that really furthering the art form in, in the long term? And, and that's sort of what, is what has to be weighed when we go through all of this. And that's why we need to discuss it, because we can't lose sight of what, when you're up to your ass in alligators, you forget you went in there to clean the swamp. <laughs> um, other strengths, I wanna, I'd, I'd like to hear more strength, because sometimes people think their strength turns out to be a weakness. Now, they, now, these strengths are all good because that's what you're passionate about and that's what you believe in. Now, the, the question is, is how are you going to translate that into attracting your audience? Do people want to buy, you know, vision? Or do they want to buy entertainment? So how do you position your uh, community-based actors who aren't as maybe qualified as the... the, the um, you know, the, the equity actors to um, guarantee you're going to have a, a fun night. There's no answer to that. That's, that's your job, is how do you get the words out that make it exciting to, like, discover somebody new, um, see the passion of, of, of an aspiring student or um, um, a really talented prodigy who's driven to, to, do, to, do, the, uh, to do your art. Um, so the next step would be the weaknesses. And how would we define weaknesses? Well, those are the things that we are not so good at. So if a strength is also a weakness, you need to look at that to say, well, we're not going to advertise that we're a great company and, and you know, we're a top professional company um, when we know that when the audience shows up, they're going to see that we're not. Um, you talk about the passion. You talk about the energy. You talk about the, the vision, the drive, the, the development. You know, everybody likes to see the star before they were a star. And that's the kind of message that turns a weakness into a strength and recognizes not to put forth things like you're not going to talk about your lavish sets and your um, gorgeous scenery and lighting or um, first class um, venue with lots of restrooms and never stand online uh, because that's not a strength. That is a weakness. And we don't bring up the weaknesses. Next is opportunity. Now, what is an opportunity? An opportunity is a situation that presents itself that you could take advantage of. And what might that look like? Uh, well, a new, a new hotel is being built, and uh, we can partner with them to give them visibility, and they give us visibility to their uh, attend, you know, their uh, residents, their guests. Another, another opportunity might be that um, a new corporation has just opened its doors and they're a supporter of the arts. That happened with Chicago when Boeing moved from Washington State to Chicago. That was a, a big opportunity for lots of Chicago companies. Um, what are some opportunities coming up in, uh, here in, in, in Stewart or have presented themselves in Stewart in Martin County? 
A new governor who's, I don't know, I'm making things up. I know the governor is not that. Forget that, forget that one. I'm thinking of, I'm, I'm, I, I, was, I was thinking, I was, I was back in, no, 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 I was back in Chicago. I, I lapsed into Chicago. Sorry about that. Other opportunities in Martin. Well, that's good. That would go under the external assessment of the change in population. But an opportunity would be that uh, the, fund, the, the, the hotel tax comes back or something like that. Uh, a, new, a new company came in or a, a new snowbird came in who just loves the arts and he's living here all year round. We are using Amendment 2 as an opportunity this year. We scheduled <clears throat> That's a double-edged sword, by the way. <laughs> it's a double-edged sword. I, I, I'll tell you that my ticket sales for this show are better than any show I've ever done before. OK. Um, You're getting a whole new demographic. We are we're getting a whole new demographic. And I feel like most of our patrons, um, we're not, the, show does not ad, the show does not advocate for legalization of marijuana. The show is more of a It's a, it's a parody, I know. Parody it's from the 50s. Right? Well, that's definitely an opportunity. <laughs> I know the Colorado Symphony wanted to have a, what did, what did they call it? A, I can't remember the, what the, the a, a pot concert or something like that. And um, their patrons just hated that idea. And they were going to celebrate all the, the legalization business and do it as a fundraiser. And that just totally fell flat on its face. <laughs> Hmm. Very good, yeah. Karen? Um, that has to do with relevance, and I was going to say something about the Indian Revolution, and now we've got this thing all on board with the uh, trains coming through Stewart and changing our lives forever. And if you have relevance in programming or something that like shock value or that, that people say, wow, yeah, right? And if you have the opportunity to publicize that. Years ago, we had more coverage with a uh, review at our concerts or at our events, which we no longer have that. And so you've lost that marketing opportunity because you can always, that gets your name out there, you hmm. get the good word, and then you can use those very reviews to continue promoting your organization. And we just don't have that anymore. With everyone in this, it's very hard to get, well, who is a reviewer anymore? Uh, Jamie Vegan. Exactly. Yeah, Jamie Vegan. And just one person has to be in the seven then yep. it's very difficult to pick and choose, and I have no idea how we do that. But that has changed. You know, it used to be a good way of getting your name out there, uh, and those were definitely opportunities. And it was up to you as the marketing person right. to call that person, say what you were doing, and say, oh, you've got to be here because it's this and this, and so-and-so is coming, we have a star coming, and you had all these opportunities of promoting yourself. We don't have that anymore here. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking one of the things that the retail in industry created for itself. They created an opportunities for, th for themselves to increase business that they wouldn't normally have done um, is by creating these, these over the top holiday events. So look at what happened to Halloween. Halloween has become as, it, it's like Christmas. I mean, the decorations and the costumes and all of that, th that was an opportunity that was created Another would be uh, even even the Easter. I see the, the on the lawns up go the um, the Easter bunnies, and every every holiday creates its own new opportunity to push merchandise. Uh, there may be opportunities for you collectively because you know that you're down in in the in the winter, in the summer, to create maybe special festival as an opportunity that you can all collaborate on, get funding from. Uh, 
powers that would say this is something we would invest in because it's going to bring more traffic and population that we wouldn't normally see. So collaboration could be this, this opportunity. Um, finally, there is the concept of the threat. Now, what is a threat? A threat is a situation that will present itself that could prevent you from being successful. Uh, a hurricane could be a threat. Um, another threat could be... Loss of a venue. Hmm? Right, that, that's a threat. Uh, and there's often things that you, you can't do anything about the threat, but if you can anticipate them, you can either plan for them, work around them, or attack them head on. I mean, another, another idea of a threat would be that there was a construction project going on outside your venue for a year, and, you, and people won't be able to get in. That's, that would be a threat. Maybe a solution to the threat would be to move out for a year and, and put your programs on somewhere else. Yes? The, the loss of humans <clears throat> behind the media, like reporters or reviewers. I mean, they're just so, the, 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 there's so few real people working. You know, it's so much of it seems to be automated. That is very true, and that has been a, a, a threat all along that, that the, the traditional media has declined to the point where they're all threatened themselves to, to, to dissolve. But then that affords you an opportunity to use the new media, which is internet, and which is something that we are now doing in Twitter, yep, yep, yep. and all those, and Facebook, and using another aspect of marketing. That's, well, that's, that is the way the threat is not necessarily an opportunity, but it's, it's informing you the idea that you have to compensate for that. And we'll show you that how the web, because one of the threats uh, to um, what we do is just the changing media itself and the way people relate to media. We're going to get into the whole tactical thing. We're going to take a break shortly and, and come back and start getting into the nitty gritty of how to harness all of this and put it together. So we've covered the strategies, objectives, and goals, and the situation assessment. Uh, we're going to take a break. A any questions before we go? Yes? I have a question on the external assessment. Yes. I'm not sure where you should go to gather all Okay, I'm glad you asked that question. I haven't really been giving you the what, you know, how to, how to do it stuff. I've been giving you the theory, hoping you'd ask questions like that. You have more resource available to you now than you have ever had before. How many of you ever go to the library anymore? I'm glad to see one or two hands go up, but okay. But there's so much faster information and more thorough information available right through the internet. Um, you can go online and do a, um, a county, read the latest county studies. There is county studies by the state and by the census for Martin. I've done ex extensive research for Miami-Dade and there is not only the information on the census, from the census, but you get education statistics. You can find employment statistics. You want to know who the major corporations are, how many employees they all have, where your sources of audiences can come from. You know, we think about spending money on getting uh, emails out and, and email blasts out. Think in terms of if you could connect with one human resource executive in a, in a corporation with a few hundred employees and they will help you get your message out. Think how much endorsement you've gotten at the same time. Um, but where are they and how do you find them? So you can, you can look them up and you can find them through corporate analysis. You can look up the foundations. I'm just giving you the broad strokes. Foundation Directory, GuideStar, they tell you who's funding what. Um, this is all part of your external assessment. Um, who's done this sort of thing? Okay, what, what, where else have you looked? Um, we really went through spending $150 on the time. See, this all is valuable information that would go into your customer 
profile. Demographics, behaviors, what they would, they wouldn't do. Who they are might be a source of going to the external assessment to see what is the total population that you're not reaching. You may be very well saturated in your, in your area and there isn't going to be much room to that audience anymore. That you may have to rethink things and expand into a new population. What's the snowbird population? You'll find that out and not just anecdotally by talking to each other, but you'll actually be able to quantify it. We've, we've gone through the first part of the marketing plan, which is the stuff that you don't even get started on to bring in that first ticket or sell that first um, membership or, or attract that first student. This is all of the setup work. Now, we'll talk in the, in the tactical part as we discuss the components of a tactical strategy or a tactical plan, rather. Sounds like it's, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and we'll go into things like surveying and customer databases. We'll get into some of the digital marketing uh, pros and cons and, and methods of going about it. And all of this will fall under the topic of tactics. So the tactics, as we said earlier, was how you reach your goals. We've set up the goals. We know we want to increase subscriptions by X percent. We want to bring in X amount of revenue. Um, we need X amount of students to fill the program and the like. But before we start talking about that, I want to go over with you the difference between marketing and advertising. We all know what this ad is, and we can see how from the brand identification of the world famous Campbell Soups, made even more famous by Andy Warhol, uh, in certain circles, of course. Uh, they, they have really not changed their uh, brand, the, the soup can still looks the same, but their, their imaging, their, their messaging, is, it's interesting to see what an evolution it was. From the first ad in 1957, when we all remembered the mm -mm good, the commercials, when we were just about being born, um, some of us don't remember. <laughs> Uh, that was post-radio days, but pre-color television. Um, the Campbell Soup was one of the big advertisers. You can see by a decade later, they completely changed their, their messaging. It was now about speed, the, the fast food, fresh food. The chubby kids were no longer quite the same vogue. But today, we go from the chubby kids as the brand to the, the bearded smartest kid in the world who knows, you know, because parents are now over, <laughs> making their children overachievers and everything is, is, is um, part of their education. And they created this, this icon of, of um, the smartest kid in the world and they've done a whole campaign around it. All about just getting the attention for the brand. We also see advertising, and we do advertising, because we see advertising seems to work for brand uh, products. Why? Because the more impressions you can get, the more uh, a person is going to move in the direction of your brand. But what are the kinds of products and services that benefit from this kind of general image advertising that we were looking at. It's the, it's the kind of product or service that everybody uses. So when you watch, you, we, we do watch TV, don't we? Sometimes. <laughs> we still watch network TV and see the commercials. What are the kind of commercials that you see actually on TV? You'll see things like car commercials and insurance commercials and financial commercials, and food commercials, mm, lots of food commercials, because we all have to eat. 
we all don't necessarily have to use the arts. You know, we, we know the, the Maslow um, hierarchy of needs and basics are at the bottom and the self-actualization is at the top and we recognize that the arts is up there at self-actualization. Well, there are some times that advertising will work for the arts in general if there's big festivals where it's attracting a mass audience because there's something for everybody, like lots of food and uh, the art may be incidental or it's a, it's, even it's a, a rock concert, which is just a, a happening that's attracting lots of people. How can a, a dance company benefit from running ads when most people aren't even going to pay attention to them? And the answer is it's because advertising like this will work when they're placed in places where people are going to find out about it. That may sound kind of counterintuitive, but these ads ran side by side in the New York Times on the dance page. Why? Because people would go to that page to learn about dance and therefore the advertising would make sense. Sometimes you're offered advertising by a, a publication where they'll say, oh, you know, we've got a placement in our travel section that um, we're going to give it to you for half price. And you think, well, that's, that might be a bargain. But it's not going to work for you if people are going there looking for travel and not for an art event or a remnant ad on a um, inside news page where people are just passing through and the only ads they're looking for is they've been conditioned for department store ads on the inside of the news page. Why? Because it's become habit. So this is when advertising works best for arts. It's when people are already looking for the message you, you're offering. In urban centers where arts are a major uh, activity, it's also much easier. So you will be, have a successful ad with, in New York with somebody like Long Long uh, because it's got a huge piano population and arts, uh, some, uh, classical music population and people will recognize him. And of course the Broadway shows need to be out there and people go to Times Square and they just look at the marquees and a lot of that helps reinforce decisions that they're already making because they wouldn't be in Times Square if they weren't attracted to seeing something on Broadway. Sometimes there's opportunity when your organization has a more mass appeal. This is an example of a bus ad run by the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago because they have, you know, have millions of kids coming through the Shedd all the time and they've already become familiar with them and they can afford for, for this kind of advertising to help build traffic. But it's an expensive endeavor and it really probably would not work for a, a small organization up in Lincoln Park for the obvious reason, because they just won't have that kind of recognition. So we're gonna talk about marketing now. We start with the four Ps. Now I've mentioned, and uh, tell me your name again. Jake. Jake. Jake mentioned the first of the four Ps, and you said that the first one was? Product. Product. So the four Ps are what affects a person's ability to make a purchase or part with their money uh, for goods or services. And this is the same principle that, um, as I said, Starbucks and IBM uses and that uh, the New York Philharmonic uses and that you can all be using. Now your product is really you. We're a service organization, unless we're selling a painting and then we're a product organization, or we're selling goods, but most of what we do is a service. We put on a play and people come and enjoy it and then they go home and the play evaporates. There's nothing left except the memory. Same with music. It evaporates, it af it evaporates after the second it's over. And uh, it, it was a service that we provided. So we think in terms of product and service. 
The next of the P's is the price. Now, price is a really critical element because it helps dictate your brand. Tiffany's would charge $35 for that pen, which is a reasonable price for a pen considering that it is, you know, better than a Bic, you know, which Bic would never charge $35 for. Or a Mont Blanc, where the price of that pen is the status symbol of it, which is $100. Price is a dictator of, of quality and value. We think that if we discount all the time, like the subscriber, and this was uh, something that started a long, long time ago, that by discounting to subscribers, we would attract more subscribers because we're making the price more affordable. The truth of the matter is, if you think about it, the subscriber who is willing to give up their money a year in advance, I'm talking about a subscriber to the theater or a symphony orchestra or a dance company, that they're willing to give up their money a year in advance for a program that they have no idea what's going to probably be performed, but they're absolutely devoted to wanting to be at your performances, you're giving them a 20% discount, you probably could have charged them a premium and they would still come because that's the way they feel about you. They are your best customer. They are paying a premium for those great seats that you make available to them and those special receptions and parties and, and meet and greets the artists that you've made available to them. So it's unfortunate, but now we're stuck with it because subscribers expect the discount. But probably we have left millions of dollars on the table over the years. The next thing of the four Ps, and this is as much a thing for the arts as it is for commercial, is place. So where the bread is placed on the shelf is a big influence on um, who's going to buy it. If something's on the bottom of the shelf in the supermarket, it's not going to be seen. It's going to have less sales. If your venue is hard to get to, it's a problem and you're gonna lose audience. Or if you're in a great location, we all know location, 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 you are going to improve uh, productivity. Also, when we think of place, we also think of placement, which includes time. Like if you're putting on your best programming in, in the non-snowbird period, you're going to lose audience because they're physically not there. That also is an issue of place. Now, you can use place, as we talked earlier, to your benefit based on the timing. Network programmers are champions at when to place a program because they know certain time slots are going to be better than others. And if they want to kill a show, they're going to move it to a bad slot and get rid of it. So that's what we mean by place. And then finally, the one thing we have control over the most is the promotion. But if you notice, promotion is only one part of the whole marketing plan. If the other three aren't working for you, it doesn't matter how great your promotion is, it's not going to help. If you've got lousy promotion, but you've got great product, the right price, in the right place, you're going to be successful. We would say that you know you could do full page ads for some rising um, violinist, but you could probably send out a little postcard in a microtype in Courier on a Manila postcard saying Itzhak Perlman will appear at the local library on such a day at such a time, and you would be sold out before the mail finished hitting because of all that's behind it. So when you're planning your marketing and you're thinking about how much you're spending on your promotion, ask yourself, did you sacrifice anything over here uh, with the other three Ps? Now, one of the things about price that you need to be careful of is to think that you can make up your budget by increasing your price or you're going to increase your house by lowering your price. Very often, the lower prices 
indicate a lesser quality performance, especially when you've got a touring company coming through that's charging $150 a ticket. What's your local, uh, do you have a local Broadway venue that, where, where the tours come through? Where did you say? Kravis Center, okay. So you're, in a sense, competing with the Kravis Center on price because they're gonna charge, what, $150 for a, an Annie coming through or a, a Book of Mormon coming through and you're gonna charge uh, $15 for your performance. People are gonna look at that and go, you know, is it even worth getting out of bed for, especially when there's the rest of the costs around it that are far greater than the price of your ticket. So when you're planning your price, you, you want to talk to your, your uh, patrons and, and really feel, find, feel them out for what they would pay for a particular event. And at the same time, you know, you can't overprice something when people recognize it's not gonna be the value that they would pay for something else. Like in, in, in the case of the Curtain Call Theater, for example, you know that you're down on um, sets and lighting, but you're up in passion, so you want to find the right price to make that, that work for both you and also for your patron. But your patron wins because if your price is wrong, they're not going to spend it. And it could be too high and it could also be too low. The fifth P that we, I wanted to add on, to you, add on for you is called positioning. And positioning is, is something that it came out, I'd say, in, in, the, in the 80s. Um, where you are putting your organization against something else. So positioning might be live performance versus kids on the couch watching TV or addicted to video games. If you're appealing to parents why they should bring their kids to your event, that would be the kind of thing you might position against the other empty-minded activities that kids might be involved in. If you're a, um, oh, I'm trying to think of an example of, let's say a, a symphony orchestra position. Well, there's, you know, the, the, the big symphony orchestras still won't let go of the term that they're the big five, you know, the East Coast big, big orchestras. They're still the big five, you know, when all other orchestras are less than they are. And, um, the rest of the orchestra world is trying to position themselves to say, you know, we're a lot better than, than they are these days, and we've got all the commissions and the, and the young conductors and the rising artists, and, you know, we're far better community server than somebody else, than the big five. So they are positioning themselves, and that is a way of building brand and value. Then there's segmentation based on product. And this is something American Express has done brilliantly. So they created, after they were very successful with the green card, um, and their slogan, if you remember, don't leave home without it, um, they started to come up with differentiation of the product, uh, which was really very clever. So they created the gold card. Gold card was so successful because people saw that as a status symbol, you know, you put that down. They came up with the idea of the platinum card. Now, I got to tell you, this is marketing at its most brilliant because they're getting people to spend hundreds of dollars a year for status. I mean, when you look at what the benefits are for the platinum card, you don't get anything. Except that it's platinum. Except that it's not even platinum. It's still plastic. <laughs> and they have to call it platinum. If they called it, if they'd been smart enough to call the, the second card silver, they would have made the gold card the platinum card. Okay. But then they came up with something so brilliant, and that was the black card. And that was by invitation only, you had to be spending like obscene amounts of money on credit. And, and you can only be invited to pay, I think, $1,000 a year to have it. Um, but such status that you wouldn't be caught dead at a power lunch without one. And the way they presented their, their product was very different. So the green card is basically introducing a consumer to credit. And they give all of the details about the value of having a credit card, especially American, American Express. 
But then when they come up with the promotion for the platinum card, they go all out. So there's already no message needed because the green card holders are already being uh, familiar with the American Express card. This is just a status symbol to, to, to show that you've arrived. They've done their research on Mas from Maslow and all the other social uh, science that's been done on um, marketing behavior to know that less is more. So why do things seem to work for us? Well, we've been successful so far, and you haven't been to a marketing seminar quite like this before, have you? No, I'm sure a lot of this information is hitting you for the first time. But things seem to work, and it's because we are, we are functioning like regular business. In business, we say the 80-20 rule, 80% of your business comes from 20% uh, of your customers. In the arts, I'd say it's even more intense. In the arts, it's more like 90% of your business comes from 2% of your customers. I mean, if you think of the price that individual pays for your ticket plus the amount of money you're getting from donations, you are just basically surviving because a handful of people have believed in you and are making that work for you. So there's very little that you can do to mess that up. We're not, nobody's going to go out and blow themselves in the foot by uh, insulting all their board members and donors. We know that we should be catering to them. But our goal is to now increase part of that share, and, and that's the reason we need to focus on this. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, the, the whole idea of discounts and subscriptions was a good thing. Well, it started in 1977 by a Chicago publicist named Danny Newman, who wrote this book called Subscribe Now, which some people still read, and it's still being sold, which talks about if you just advertise and promote and, and say how great you are and use lots of great pictures, um, and discount your subscriptions, you'll be successful. But of course, that stopped working for us quite the way it, it did in the 70s and 80s. And the damage was, I'm afraid, done. <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit now about messaging, the, the categories of messaging. We've already talked about branding. The next category of, inf of messaging is the way we present the information. So how do we do that? Through TV and media, through outdoor, through print, through new newsletters, and through our websites. What are these vehicles there for? They're for reaching people who are already predisposed to attending and giving them the information that they need to do that. And I'm going to give you some examples. Um, all right, before I, before I do that, we're going to go on to the fourth category, which is the call for response. Now we're going to get into the area of response marketing. We say that there are three legs to the stool to make it balance. And the same is true with getting that call to action. We have the offer. The offer is what we want people to do, which is to buy our product, our tickets, come to our events, uh, attend our schools, register. There is the target, and that is the group that is going to do it. And then finally, there is the medium, and that is the specific message. Now, the message that I gave you uh, for American Express was essentially the medium. The medium in the print advertising was the ad itself, if you noticed, in the dance ads, because people are not out going to buy a car and they know where the dealerships are. They are uh, going to a particular event. The ad needed to have the time, the date, the program, and some attractive attraction to the ad, but that would essentially be the information. So in the case of the direct response medium, there, there has to be the more targeted message that is going to specifically call to action from the individual. And that all leads to this idea of response. So the question is, does direct mail still work? How many of you still use direct mail? 
one. Okay, so you, you never send anything out with a postage stamp on it. To, you, okay, so one more time. How many of you still use direct mail? Not at all. Interesting. Okay, we can talk about that. Um, most organizations that of, a, of a sizable budget still use direct mail. And the reason is because they have discovered that physically having something in hand has a stronger ability to get itself read and also passed along to other people than, than just digital advertising, digital marketing. So here's a case of the San Francisco Opera. They've got not one, but they've got two brochures that they publish because they're, they're talking now to different groups of people in their market. The, the, the season is for the subscriber. The individual that they know will buy whatever tickets they have to offer as long as they get the certain night of the week and um, there, there are seats. And then there are those that are more picky. So they still want to call them subscriber because subscriber still carries a cachet with it. So they come up with something called design your own season which is another way of selling single tickets, but it's been spun about to be a subscription. In fact, they have a third brochure that they create, and that is strictly for single ticket sales, where they're only going to sell one, possibly two events to an individual, because each one of these people that they've targeted are going to respond differently. In the case of memberships, membership still turns out for direct mail to be a very strong vehicle because you have the chance of getting an envelope open. How many emails do we get bombarded with a day? I mean, I get 100. If my mailbox had 100 pieces of mail in it, that would be frightening. I wouldn't be able to get it in there. So in a way, people have, have overused this digital vehicle. But in the case of these uh, destination institutions, this case, the Cincinnati Zoo, they are using a very descriptive letter to explain what membership is about. They're explaining um, with different smaller brochures what the, um, the benefits are. And all of these are saved or passed along. And you, know, you think to yourself, OK, so what's the response rate to a piece of direct mail. What should it be? Anybody? 2%. That, that's what everybody says, 2%. You know why? Because that's what magazines needed to get as a response rate. If they got less than 2%, they weren't selling enough subscriptions to make it worthwhile, and they would, they would drop the list. In our case of the arts, especially it depends on how you're packaging your price. If you're dealing with one program at a time, you've got a very low um, average order, correct? You're selling a pair of tickets. So you sell an order of tickets, that's at least two, right? People come together. Nobody buys one ticket, maybe sometimes, but not often. And then there are some that buy three or four. The value of the subscription for these organizations that send out the, the subscription brochures is that they are selling multiple tickets at one time in advance. So what does that look like? Somebody subscribes to the Atlantic, the, the, what is it, the Atlantic um, classical, classical Orchestra. And how many programs do you do? We have one major concert season, mm. so we couldn't really design your own. No, I understand. But you can sell the entire season, correct? Do you do the same program in all three? Yes. Oh. So it's that same concert week so that the musicians, if they come from out of town, can do. Just do the, the circuit. And we did something kind of cool last year. We, we, um, when we were expanding into Palm Beach Gardens, we had an open dress rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And by the last performance, we had built, filled the house at Easy Campus Theater mm -hmm. with people coming to see this open dress rehearsal. And then we were actually able to sell 
70 to 60 subscriptions for this year. Do you have pay that's great. Do you have patrons coming from one venue to another to hear the concert again? Sometimes. Not so much though. Yeah, some some of the things like I, I find in, in, in a place like Miami where organizations are going from venue to venue, um, one of the things I had recommended to to one of them was that um, they do separate brochures for the separate towns because that's and then you can talk about the experience of that town and that venue without distracting them with others. And it turned out that they were getting a lot of migration when somebody would miss a concert in one town, they'd travel to the other town to, to catch the concert. I don't know if that's your case. That well, what makes the direct mail a, a value and an ability to pay itself out is that your order is going to be a reasonably high order. So let's say, you're, well, we're going to get into cost of acquisition, so I'm, I'm jumping ahead again. But if you think about the fact, and we'll talk about how to calculate that later, if you think about the fact that, let's say somebody, somebody pays, what, what would be the price of the tickets for, for your whole season? It'd be 180 to $200. That's for four concerts. Four concerts at $200. Somebody buys two subscriptions. That's a $400 order. So let's say it costs you... Um, do the math. It costs you 50 cents to mail out by nonprofit bulk rate something brochure, for the brochure, and it's 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 50 it's 50 cents a piece. That would be 500 dollars a thousand. If you get one response per thousand, you've paid for the mailing, haven't you? And two responses, you've already made money. And if, if you're dealing with renewals, one of the things about the mail when you're dealing with your core audience is you have a better probability that everybody is going to get that piece of mail and respond. Uh, however bad snail mail is in deliverability, how many people will never see your email if you're trying to get them to come back? It's going to be a pretty high bounce rate regardless and they'll just never get the message. So are you not spending money or are you leaving money on the table? That's the question you have to ask when it comes to dealing with the mail. We've also had some success by But then you're getting a lot of the new move-ins who are probably subscribers to an orchestra somewhere else and or snowbirds or, or snor snowbirds. Where will I go? What's yeah. But you see, that's why there's no manual for this. There's no rule. You, you, you've got to think, understand what's working for you and why. And what works, you can stay with, but it may not work forever. And then you've got to measure it against the resource that it, that it takes. Let me go on. Um, OK, so the target, that's the individual. So let's talk a little bit about the database now and how to understand, and this is where the idea of knowing your subscribers, your ticket buyers, your uh, active attendees comes into play. How do they respond? By direct mail. Some will respond by email. They don't want the direct mail. Um, some actually now, you want to keep a database of people who like texting especially when you're getting younger audiences. And you want to hold on to them because they won't read emails. They'll only respond to texts. In dealing with this, one of the big difficulties you run into is not maintaining what we call edit standards. So very often you may collect lists from other organizations and, and combine them with your own. Um, and then it gets all mixed up and you, you basically have your list. And I'll ask somebody, well, how big is your database? And they'll say, it's about 4,000. And I'll ask them, well, how many of those people uh, actually attend <laughs> your events? And they'll say about 150 or 200. So they've got now mixed up with these prime important 200 people 4,800 other people that may never respond to your event. 
and you can't differentiate them. Not only that, they've, they've diluted your uh, construction of the record. So some people will have their database structured where the first name and last name is in a name field. Others will have it last name and then a first name in separate fields. Um, they'll have different ways of reading a street address. Some will be zip plus four and some will be just five digit zip code, uh, five digit zip codes. Um, and it's all over the map. You need to establish for your volunteers, for your staff who's ever entering records, a standard of how the record goes into the database. And when you're taking lists from other people, if it can't be reformatted in, into your standard, then you're gonna have trouble with deliverability and duplication and that sort of thing as well. You also need a method of updating your system. People will keep names in their database forever. Uh, how many of you do ever do, well, you don't use direct mail that much, so you don't have to worry about address correction. How do you get bad addresses and bad uh, re uh, records out of your database? How do you do it? Yeah, there, well, there are services that will, will clean up your list, but it's, it's sort of when the lists are so bad, it's not gonna be perfect, and when you do, when you do, do things like address correction through the post office, you're only getting a fraction of the bad addresses out of there. So if you, if you can do the better job at the beginning and have a way of keeping your own database clean, uh, you're gonna be way ahead of the game. Now, how many of you exchange, well, you probably don't even exchange lists amongst each other, do you? No. Not really done. So that's a lost opportunity. Uh, where do, where do I, I start with that? So you don't do it because it's not a good idea or you don't do it because it's, it's too much extra work or? And you don't just give that away. Sure. Well, nobody's talking about giving anything away, but, but, but in marketing, you, there is, there's the issue of just stepping away from personal, personal feelings, because if everybody was like you, you wouldn't be struggling to get new people, because you'd all be active in, in the arts and they would come. But we deal with this group called the heavy user, and the, the, the ability to reach the heavy user is a benefit to all of us, because the more an individual is active, the more they will continue to go. I, you, I, I can't begin to tell you that a person who's a subscriber to the symphony is not gonna get a piece of mail from the Miami City Ballet, from the Cleveland Orchestra, from the Miami City Ballet, and say, I'm abandoning my, my Cleveland Orchestra subscription and I'm gonna join the board of the Miami City Ballet. It doesn't work that way. What happens is, is you are reaching new people who are also interested because they are the heavy user. Remember I said, not only is it the demographic that's important, it is the characteristics and interest in, in, um, in doing that. Now, what would happen if you all put your list together in a big pool and unduplicated it and saw how many people you already had on it each of your lists, and they're all the same people. Not only are the ones that are duplicated all the same people, they are the ones that are spending the most money with all of you already. So what you are doing is you are leaving out the opportunity of expanding your base, which you desperately want to do, over an issue that may or may not be um, offensive. So you're saying that you personally would be offended But you're thinking in terms of emails too, right? Oh, yeah. And emails are a totally different, yeah, I'm sorry. So emails are a totally different animal. And had direct mail continued to evolve and, and, and be sustained, you wouldn't be struggling with the, the, the issues that you are now being exclusively on email because people in the direct mail getting in their mailbox 
They just don't care. They've been conditioned for getting mail that they didn't want. And you know what they do? They throw it away. And all the emails that you didn't want that bothered you, you click, 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 and it's gone. You never even opened it. And you've and you got to be careful about that, too. So right now, I, I see that there's a new scam going around where people are sending out emails saying, thank you for your purchase, and you just spent $5,000 with us, and click on here for the details. And it's, obviously, it's a Trojan. And you have to be an idiot to do that, but God knows somebody's doing it. <laughs> and it's just making email marketing tougher and tougher and tougher when there's the opportunity to at least focus on maintaining a database of direct customers that uh, you can't afford to lose uh, through any other medium that you, um, that, that you don't want to give up. So talking about the email system, I mean, that is a totally different animal because not only is it regulated based on spam uh, regulations, which the mailbox is not, uh, and they have privacy rules on the mailbox, but nothing like it is on emails. You really can't give your email list over to somebody else anyway. So you're just talking about sharing mailing. Mailing, yeah, direct mail house, you know, brochure lists. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I was. And the emailing, the, the emailing list is, is, a, is a whole different problem. Um, but we're going to talk about how to effectively use email lists. And essentially, the, the more you can get somebody to opt in to your database and want to get your emails, then the better off you are. Segmentation is the next thing. Even whether you're, you're uh, using email lists or uh, postal lists, direct mail lists, you want to be able to keep the individuals separated or at least identify them so that you have the ability to send different messages to different groups. Going back to your 80-20 rule, the person who is giving you so much business you want to have a, a much different message than somebody who's a first-time buyer who may or may not come back again. Um, you also have people who are long-term patrons of yours versus brand new, and your messaging would be totally different for them. Uh, you've got people who've stopped coming. We call them your lapsed. Um, and, um, they're still not ready to be let go yet. And obviously, you're keeping some uh, lists that are around for quite a while. And um, there are ways to keep that a little bit more effective and more clean, which we'll talk about. And you want to be able to track them. So I'm going to break down for you the categories for you to consider on who your customers are, who your patrons are. You've got your active buyers. Those would include people who are buying everything you do. You can call them your subscribers. Even subscribers are not cardboard. They're not one or two dimensional. You've got the subscriber who has been coming to you for a long time. Then you've got your brand new subscribers. We talked about the idea of renewal, that if you don't bring in any new subscribers, you're going to have a very high renewal rate because these people, the longer they're with you or the longer they're going to stay with you. The first year buyer is going to drop off more quickly. So you would want to send them many more notices before you give them a chance to fall away and drop out. Then you've got the person who's just buying a ticket whenever you advertise that there's a new show coming up, the single ticket buyer. You want to be able to separate them out from the long-term buyer. You'll get many ticket buyers who'll come once and you won't see them again. You want to be able to separate those single ticket buyers who continue to buy even once a year to see if maybe you could get them to upgrade to a subscriber or a multi-ticket buyer. So you've got your active ticket buyers, you've got your new single ticket buyers, and then you've got your once and never again ticket buyer. We call them your lapsed. And that could be a change of lifestyle that could change again. So. Maybe somebody lost their job for a couple of years and had to stop subscribing, or it was um, 
somebody that lost their partner or their spouse and they stopped coming for a while and a couple of years later they decided to come out again and you get them back. We call them lapsed and market to them and they will come back at a very specific response rate. So lapsed recents versus lapsed older. Then it's up to you to keep track of how old these people have stopped coming and stopped marketing to them because you're wasting your own time and even emails cost money and if you do a lot of emailing it's costing you money if you're just bombarding a list that nothing's happening with. Then there are the prospects and direct mail still gives you a good ability to reach prospects that you don't have with emailing. The prospects that you could collect Again, thinking in terms of either brochure for brochures or, um, or even emails would be people who inquire about your organization. So from your website, have something to say, put me on your list, or uh, you're at a, point, a, a, a venue or a place where people can fill out a, a mailing list card, whether it's email or snail mail. You have the ability to trade, again, for uh, direct mail which are very powerful because you've identified people who are already interested in the arts. And then there's, as Karen mentioned, something called a rental. So understanding a person's lifestyle, you may do very well by sending a brochure or a piece of direct mail to that person. Who might that be? Maybe it's the, the local magazine that's the entertainment magazine that has a list that they would give to you for a price that you could mail your brochure to and see if you get a response from that. And then really at the bottom are what we call the compile lists and those would be just general email lists or um, lists taken from directories where we don't really know what the person's interested in or we really have from them as a name or an address. They tend to do much less of a response, almost no response because we need to know that they're already interested in the arts. One of the things that marketing does not do is it doesn't educate in the sense that it's not convincing somebody who's not an arts lover to love the arts. It doesn't do that. It, it only really works when the person is predisposed and has the interest. So anything that can give us that extra piece of information will be worth having. So to recap, in addition to the, the basics that we need, and we need every one of these, name, um, for the obvious reason, address, city, state, zip, and now email, and a phone number. Why do we need a phone number? Because it gives us the, another ability to unduplicate it against another record. And also, in certain records where we need to reach somebody by phone, Let's say you've got a subscription campaign going and they've absolutely dropped off and you haven't heard from them. You could still make that final phone call and say, we haven't heard from you. Is anything wrong? We're concerned. And they go, oh, I'm so glad you called. This happens very often. Okay, here's my order. So um, keep the phone number. But then we also need to know transaction data, as I explained. How much did they spend with you? What did they spend it for? what was purchased, when did they do it? This, the rule is called recency frequency. The more recent a person responded, the more likely they will respond again. When's the best time to send an offer to somebody when you just received their last offer? Think about the uh, political fundraising mail we all get, right? As soon as you give a donation, it's, it's the, the, the doors open. It never stops and the more frequently a person responds, um, the more recent a person responds, the more likely they're going to get that. And the more frequently they respond, um, the more likely they're going to get that. You want to keep track of the amount they spend with you and also be able to consolidate this all into one account. So that means investing in some kind of uh, transaction software, whether it's a fundraising package or a ticketing package. Uh, what, kind, what kind of software are you all using? Anything in particular? 
Now, one of the things that is going to be affecting you in particular here, I believe, is the fact that you're a big snowbird community. When is the right time to contact somebody and when? Where and when? So you need that kind of data, not just one address or one email in your system, but maybe multiples. Um, know what the seasons are for when they um, are going to be here and find a way of collecting that data. And finally, their interests. If you're doing multiple activities, if you're doing some chamber music and some vocal series, or if you're doing different kind of arts exhibits or um, education programs, some people will be interested exclusively in education, and others will be interested only coming to opening nights of new ex uh, exhibitions. Get to know them so you're not bombarding them with things that they're not interested in, and in a calculated way, you can try to cross them over. OK, so we've covered the target. We've talked a little bit about the offer. And now let's talk about the medium, which then brings us back to that. OK, the most important thing about any message is what we call the teaser. Because if you can't get them back past the teaser, you're not going to get them into the full-blown message. So in the case of direct mail, the most important part of the package is the, either the outer envelope or the outside of the brochure, the cover. Now, I always ask the question, what is the front of the brochure, especially when it's being received in the mail? Well, we'll take a look at that. And then for the email, the most important language in the entire email is that subject line. OK, so here is the cover of the uh, San Francisco Opera, right? This comes in your mailbox, and this is the first thing you see, correct? Wrong. First thing you see is the mailing panel. This is the most important piece of art in the package. Why? Because if they don't turn it over, if they're not interested, if they just throw it away, they're never going to see anything else. They're never going to see the message. So the San Francisco Opera was smart enough to get their offer right there at the top. Four opera packages starts at $72. The problem with this is they distracted you with all this other stuff which didn't add to anything about the offer necessarily, and I don't think they thought about it, because I have yet to figure out why corporate sponsor logos are going to get you into the package. Here's the Atlanta Ballet, a really lovely cover. Even with a good message, join us for a season of passion, uh, power and passion. But they were smart enough and knowledgeable enough to put a mailing panel that indicated the 14, season package is now available, and then give the website or call, at least to know if you're interested in it, you're going to turn it around. Here's another example. This is from Music Theater and Dance, where they're obviously trying to get a message through. But when you look at their mailing panel, this could be anything. It's got a, a QR code, and it says, if you don't want it, give it to a friend. Where's the? teaser there, bad, bad, bad judgment. Then there's the story. Story requires what we call selling copy, not program notes. OK, let's talk about messaging, actual, the actual wording of what, how we go about speaking to people through these, these different media. Think of it whether it's direct marketing, email marketing, even your text in your, your websites, in your Facebook pages, however you're communicating, how do you do it? The voice you want is that you're personalizing it, that you are speaking to the individual, not to the masses. The key words that are still popular, that still work better than others, is the word you, and you talk about your organization, not necessarily in the third person. The dance company was formed in 18, 
20 and is 190,000 years old, it, it, it doesn't resonate. It's a program note. You want to talk to people. We did this. I did this, etc. You also want to provide them something of what's in it for me. The word free is still the most popular word in the, in the, the marketing language. When something is free, it, it gets someone's attention. A free drink after the concert, a toast to the artist, a free brochure every year, which you're going to give them anyway. Um, <laughs> but something to make the appeal specific and not just coming along. So here's a great slogan. A perfect season is in your hands, emphasizing the word your. Also, I like this. Our season was orchestrated for someone very special, you. Good so far, right? And then I looked at the front mailing label, and it was all logos and a label, and I never got the message. Yes, it is. <laughs> Later. <laughs> OK, then we're talking about the different segments that, that we have uh, identified. The active buyer, the one-time ticket buyer. Create your targeted personal messages. So this was a brochure for a performing arts venue trying to attack, attach the, uh, or attack rather, a first-time subscriber. Uh, it was sent to a list of single ticket buyers. It spoke to them about saving as a call to action money on their subscription as a first timer. They could buy tickets to special events that the general public wouldn't be able to, and reminding them when you subscribe, second person, not third person. I'm going to go through this one real quick. This was a, a brochure put together by the uh, Boston Symphony introducing their new music director. Understanding that there's a different mindset between their subscriber and their single ticket buyer. So the cover for the subscription was there. Same, practically the same for the single ticket buyer, but they went to the trouble of adding to the mailing panel uh, tickets on sale. Uh, on August 4th. And then the inside cover is a personalized message from the music director. Why? Because that was what they knew was important to subscribers. They're the loyalist, most devoted. Getting a personal message from the music director meant more to them. To the single ticket buyer, eh, not important. Tell me what's, what concerts are going on. So they go into with the same photo, as you can see. They changed the whole message to make it appealing specifically to what they said was important to them. Even the calendar layout was totally different. In the subscriber calendar, they didn't care what the program was, except that they wanted to know because they were going to go to it anyway. Just tell me where it was, where it is, and what time, and make sure I have the right seats. The single ticket buyer was all chronological, and then a special little description of each concert so that they knew what they were going to be buying for that particular concert. Totally different mindset communicating to a totally different customers, even though they're buying the same type of ticket. When you're creating your selling points, you want to create what we call benefits versus features. What is a benefit? What is in it for me, the consumer, versus what's a factoid that I might read in the program note. Um, and how do you find out what those are? Use the situation assessment and the SWOT analysis as the basis for your copy points. I found this, this, this painting because what you want to be able to do is empathize with your reader. When you think of what you like, what's important to you, we call that myopic marketing. What we want to do is get into the head of the person we want to communicate to and understand what they feel so that we can talk to them in their terms. So benefits versus features. Don't sell me clothes. Sell me attractiveness. Don't sell me shoes. Sell me comfort. Don't sell me a book. Sell me knowledge. Don't sell me a car. Sell me an escape. I mean, that's a good one because you can see some of the car advertising 
is really reflecting a person's persona of, of themselves. You want to put your offer at the top. And I'm talking about emails. I'm talking about brochures. I'm talking about letters you would write to your donor. Don't give a very long preamble about how great everything was and how grateful you are and all of the, the long thank yous. Get to the point. We, we want your help. We need your help. We're in a end of year capital campaign or annual campaign and we, we want your support. Get that at the top. People will not wait to find out what you're writing to them about. Then rank your copy points. What's the most important thing that you need to tell them? What's the second most important? What's the third most important? One of the things about an email that works so well is you can make the most important thing right in the email, and then when you want to get into the more detail, let them click through, and then all the additional points will follow in the website. You want to summarize your copy points. In other words, after you've basically told them what you want them to know, tell them what you told them. Because people will skim read even if it's an email or even if it's a website. Expand on your copy points, then summarize again. And then always ask for the action. The action is the offer at the top, subscribe, buy tickets, come to the exhibit, and then at the end, and that's why we want you to do these things. And then at the end, you, you want to restate your key benefit. So remember, as a subscriber, you get the best seats. You never miss a, a program. Um, you get advance notice, whatever it happens to be. Keep your sentences short. Remember, you're not writing program notes, which can go on forever. People want to see short sentences. They don't have the patience for long sentences. Keep your language simple. If, if you can say the word buy, use it instead of the word purchase. That's two syllables. Um, keep it simple. One syllable and basic words as much as possible. Keep your thoughts relevant. Don't go off on a tangent. Our, our music director was off on tour, and he had a reception with the king and the queen. And isn't that great? And not relevant to the fact that you want them to buy a ticket. Avoid esoteric cleverness. Humor is, is good in certain contexts. It's not really good in selling copy, because what's funny to one person can be offensive to another person. We all know that from the Williams sisters, right? Second guess questions and uh, answer them. The purpose of giving a message is you're trying to anticipate what a person needs to know. So if they're going to say, well, when is it? You need to tell them the time. Is the parking free? Or how do I park? You want to tell them in advance. You're anticipating questions before they're even asked. And then use enthusiasm, but don't embellish or lie. And I always say you don't want to do what's called the bait and switch. Promise them great seats and then put them somewhere that's not great. Or tell them it's dazzling and, and spectacular scenery, and then it turns out that it's not. <laughs> Be honest, but embellish on what's strong and avoid what's weak, but don't lie. So we've covered the teaser, the story, the selling copy. Equally important, but not to be misplaced, is what we call the utility copy. Once you've gotten a person's attention and interest, you need to be able to lead them through the order. So here, the utility copy is, there's no benefits here. This is the, what's important for them to know so they can make the decision about the concert. Uh, we call that utility copy. What's the seating going to look like? You wouldn't put this up front because they haven't decided they want to buy it, but they'll need to know what the configuration of the house is if they're going to be placed. Um, and what are the prices? These are all utility things. This goes at the end after a person's decided to buy, or it becomes a link on the website when they are ready to buy, click to buy here. So the website becomes a tremendous vehicle for digital marketing because you don't have to overwhelm somebody with all the information the way a brochure gets overwhelming. Um, and for those who buy online, which is a continuing to, uh, to grow number, 
Um, and I know I'm old when I, I remember the days when the box office was the most popular place to buy a ticket. Um, now it's the least, actually. Um, you can set up with different links what people need to do and send them where they need to go according to what they want to buy. And you want to make that very easy for them. So looking at many of your websites, I asked myself, are you making it clear what you want me to do coming to the website? And would I know where to go once I got there? So these are major organizations like the Metropolitan Opera, the Boston Symphony. Um, the techniques that they're using can, just, can be done just as easily with, with some of the online web services at a fraction of the cost because you can buy calendars, you can buy shopping carts for tickets and registrations and whatever it is that you're offering. That the limitations that you had because of budget once upon a time those walls have fallen way, way down. And the opportunities are there if you can take the time to learn them. Even to the point where the next big thing is going to be everything on phone apps. And uh, organizations are now investing totally separately on to how to use the telephone, the, the phone app for the next generation. A little discussion about graphics. Graphics should be supporting the message, not fighting the message. The graphics follow the message. So I've got this little thing, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Good graphics uh, support the message. Bad graphics confuse the message. And the ugly message, the ugly is when you get into a fight with your <laughs> artistic, uh, your, your designer over the way the thing is supposed to look because they lost the point of the message. All right, the Cleveland Orchestra, a good example of, and many orchestras started to do this, where the idea is to sell the experience and not to face the music director, especially trying to um, show that, that uh, younger audiences belong as much as um, anybody. Here the, the message was the, the iconic nature of the artist. So all the most popular artists were thrown on the cover to get them in, not necessarily the pretty venue or things that people were already familiar with or not interested in. Here's an example of what I consider to be a bad graphic, very pretty photo that tells nothing about what it is that's going on inside. And just looking at this, I would not even know. And Again, here's another one which is no selling copy, no interest to get me inside unless I'm already loyal and, and familiar. And the graphic is just another pretty design. OK, then finally, the response device is the, is the last most important thing. And why should you even have something like this? This could be on the website. This could be in a, in a printed brochure. Why do you even need this if nobody's ever going to use it? And the answer is because people need to be led through the process of how to purchase. When they have a salesperson in front of them or somebody on the phone to lead them, they make it easy for them. Uh, it's, it's not that people can intuitively know what to do. So you need to lead them. Here's a couple of examples. It tells you how to order, fill in the blank, make the list. And then what happens is if they want to go to the website and start working with it, or they found this on the website, it makes it easy for them to fill it in and hit the submit button, and the order is complete. But if they get confused and they do have to call, they've already got their order set up in advance, so it goes much more quickly on the phone. And here's another one that's sort of like a, a form to fill out, which just is to make you more familiar with the process, how to order one, two, three, takes you step by step all the way to getting the order placed. Um, interactive communications such as email and newsletters, these are all evolving technology. We, we really don't know how to totally monetize them. Certainly the response on emails are um, nowhere near what the physical printed mail ha has ever been. You know, if you get um, 
I'll, I'll say if I, you get like a 10% open rate from existing customers, that's high. If you send out, if you send out a, a printed brochure, you would expect to get like a 50, 60%. You, you were going to say... Mm -hmm. So they're getting that conditioning a lot. But are you getting, are you, okay. I don't help them. Right. I'm going to send them out when it's important. Now, that, that's fine. Now, when you get an open rate, what, what kind of an open rate do you get? Um, it goes anywhere from 30 to 24, sometimes up to 60. Okay. And are these like co core ticket buyer, or core, core uh, well, renew buyers? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I would I would challenge I would challenge you to take that core group of of, of high level buyers, repeat buyers, and send them something physical in the mail and, and measure the response. And see if you're because you you know, you it's not just that you're comparing open rates and, and response rates. You are dealing with lost revenue over a lifetime buyer because they, they missed you for whatever the reason. You bounced, you clean them off, and, and, and they're gone. Especially when you're dealing with an average order of a couple of hundred dollars. You know, you've got two orders of, of subscriptions at 200 each, that's $400. If you lose five of them, that's $2,000, even though your response rate is high. Big deal. <laughs> okay, so think about that. All right, so we've got all kinds of things that we don't understand. Um, that's going to be the subject of other seminars, right? right? We're doing one on technology. Okay, so that'll include the websites, podcasts, blogs, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The problem with all of these is they are time-consuming, unbelievable. You have to do a post a day, two posts a day, just to keep people involved. One or two posts a week, maybe not enough. I did some surveys with people uh, reading the Boston Symphony um, emails, uh, not emails, uh, Facebook posts. Um, they remembered maybe one a week. The BSO was send, sending out posts of two and three a day. And people who were their active buyers didn't even see them. So it's a very dangerous place to be when you're not fully aware of it, but because you have to be there, you need to be spending more time with it, and that's way, way beyond the scope of today. So, <laughs> All right, I'm going to just like, click through things we've already talked about. Uh, two kinds of emails. There's the, the, the sales ad style, which is actually a mirror of the, uh, the website for, for many of these companies, where they're getting the offer at the top, but to get further, you, you click on the ad and it takes you into the website, which is the equivalent of the old-fashioned mail order catalog. Then th there is the, the letter style, which you see a lot of the political stuff and um, financial kinds of emails coming at you, which is more in the letter format. If this is working for you, it gives you the ability to follow the same rules as we, get, we went through in talking about what works in direct mail. And remember, people need information to make a decision. Because most of us would say, well, who's going to read all of this? The answer is those who are really want to do it. And the more you give them, the more they understand of what they should be responding to. One of the things that's happening with web websites, and I'm, a f I'm not sure that it's all for the best, is that because it's become so visual and video oriented, this is from the Arsh Center. They put videos of every program. Uh, people do not have the time to watch all these videos. They'll find things that interest them, but maybe they just want to go ahead and buy. So they need to be able to go right to the, to the, to the buy page. And uh, here it looks, well, here, if, if you pay attention, you, you look for the ticket as a link. But you've got to become familiarized with that. So it's a training period and something to be careful about. Frankly, I would have made the buy, buy now type of thing more like what they did here, where they, you click on the link to see a video, but they tell you if you want to buy, buy now. 
and then takes you right to the ticket sale. Customer word of mouth is still your strongest. Another reason a brochure works is because the pass along is unbelievable. If somebody is already a supporter of yours, they're going to give it to a friend and say, you'll be interested in this. Say, here, I'm going to give you the link. They may or may not ever click on it. But the brochure is still that physical thing that can be passed along. The last phase of the marketing plan is the budget. And the most important thing to understand how to budget for marketing is to understand your concept of the cost of acquisition. So the acquisition cost is the revenue that you generate minus the expense that it takes you to generate that revenue. So for customer renewal, that is absolutely going to be your lower, lowest cost of acquisition. If you used a renewal letter, which would cost you 50 cents, and sent that out to a, renew, a renewing subscriber, you'd spend 50 cents to get back $400. That's obviously such a low cost of acquisition, you wouldn't even think of not doing that. And then when Linda tries her experiment, she'll see that she got a lot more money back than she would have expected. Um, however, as you go down the line, that cost of acquisition increases. So a new acquisition is the cost of bringing in one new person against how, many, how much you had to spend. So let's, let's use an email, for example. You bought an email campaign. What do you pay for an email campaign, somebody? Help me. What do you pay? 40 a month. 40 a month. Through, constant Through constant contact. Now, to new people only. Um, you pay 40 a month. What, what, when somebody buys something from you, how much does it cost? Please add us to your contacts. Please. Yeah, you're making a lot of work for them, right? OK, let's talk about direct mail for a second, because that's the easier way to understand the concept. You uh, mail out 1,000 pieces of mail. All right. So 1,000 pieces of mail will cost you $500 all in, postage, printing, whatever. Um, it's $500. Now, you've mailed, you've mailed that out, and it's to all new people. Let's say you've traded with another theater that actually had the sense to go ahead and do that with you. And you did that with them, and you mailed to this list of 1,000, and you got back, um, what do you think would be a terrible response? Five people? Uh, five uh, people would be a pretty bad okay, so five people, okay, five people responded. When they bought something, like tickets to your show, what's the average order? Average order is about 110 OK, so that's $110 times 5. $500, 550 and you got all five, And you've got five new people that you didn't have before, and you made $50 on them, which is, means that you've got these people in for nothing. And now you've expanded your buyers by a particular new group. And that's the value of what this is. Why the trades work is because they help you get that payout. They bring you the new people. You're improving the circulation of the arts community, building more heavy usage. They're not going to not come to that other organization because they came to yours, unless that other organization didn't deliver, pissed them off, and now they were going to leave them anyway. So you happen to get them, and they got a couple of yours. So it, it, it works by keeping them in the fold. Um, scheduling. Work backwards from the end game and, and develop your, your tasks. This handout that you've got is a really good worksheet. Uh, it was developed by National Arts Marketing Project. Julie Peeler, who was at the time vice president for the private sector, uh, developed the whole National Arts Marketing Project. Uh, they've got worksheets for you on how to plan working backwards your tasks and scheduling so you don't miss your dates. You make sure you get it all in and gives you the confidence to add more to it without overloading the resource because you've now done a better planning job. To measure results, as we 
said to Linda, test. Try one thing and see the results. If it doesn't work, abandon it. Give it a chance. People use, would say, well, I've tried it and it doesn't work. Maybe your one, one effort wasn't thought through well enough. But also, if it does work, we do what's called the rollout. Also, calculate the lifetime value of your patron to make it to ask yourself, is it worth it to spend and make that only $50 for this new acquisition? Because once I get a new patron, I keep them at the rate of one out of three, and then one out of two a year after that, and then one out of 1.5 or whatever, so that the value of somebody that becomes your ticket buyer or your patron is worth thousands to you over the, the life of what they're doing with you because you're growing your base. And remember, we all have attrition, so we have to be replacing the people that drop out with new people coming in or the pile gets smaller and smaller until it, it's just a couple of blue-haired old men and women and they're still there. The conclusion of the marketing plan is what will it be that will prevent me from being successful? In other words, here's my whole plan, and I want to conclude by asking myself, what will get in my way? Will it be that um, a, a, there's going to be a new venue opening up? That, that could be a problem. Um, the, the cost of doing business is going up so much that I can't keep my costs down. That would be your, your conclusion, something to think through and, um, and close with. But the goal is to think, what is it that's going to prevent me from being successful? And that's how you conclude your marketing plan. We went over the strategies, the objectives and the goals the situation assessment, tactics, and we've talked about how to budget. Budget being based on acquisition costs, and there's a lot of detail on budgeting in this, in this handout. And finally, the conclusion. We got through all the points. Thank you. I, I, I want to congratulate you for, for sitting through this. It was a tremendous amount of material to absorb. Um, a lot of you may think, well, this is so overwhelming and my budgets are so small. How can I possibly do all of this? Remember, all of this is based on, on common sense and practice and theory. All of your individual patrons want you to communicate directly to them. You want to make it simple for them to understand and you want to keep them involved and engaged, and that's what all of this was about. Any questions from anyone? Great. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for having me.